it's again my pleasure to, to, uh, to, to join another group of, of Tillman scholars. And Sanki and Joy and Blake will introduce themselves uh, here in a moment. Uh, but I think what's really sort of interesting is we have an opportunity to really take a sp specific look at one of the challenges that actually Rob mentioned earlier today in that panel of, uh, of the 2009 scholars. Um, and it was when he was talking about, um, as a scholar, you're focusing on, on academic requirements, things along those lines. But then this community um, offers an opportunity uh, to put that knowledge, skills, expertise that we've been talking about in our previous uh, panels of, of their development, it allows you to put that in action in a specific community context. And in terms of the medical field writ large, that's what we're about to talk about in some, some very different context um, along those lines. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined uh, by Blake, uh, Joy, and Sanki. And I'll allow each of you to just introduce yourselves um, in terms of where you've come as a scholar, but then also where you're practicing um, in terms of your own individual aspects of, of providing health care um, and in the community in which that that, that occurs. I think that's an uh, important and fascinating thing to uh, go with. So, so Blake, if we could start with you. Yeah, so I'm a 2013 uh, Tillman Scholar. Um, I, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist that specializes in treating military veterans with uh, various conditions related to military service to include uh, treating their, their uh, loved ones as well. Uh, joined pre-9-11 uh, the Army National Guard. Uh, I was in basic training uh, when 9-11 occurred. Uh, deployed to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Much of my time I was enlisted. I was a, a, a chief uh, a platoon sergeant, a, a calf scout. Uh, I then direct commissioned to uh, captain as a behavioral health officer where I, where I uh, work now. Interesting enough, you know, one of the things bringing us all together here is the, the conflict in Afghanistan. And in, I'm also coming to grips. Uh, my son, uh, who's 18, is, is going through the MEPS process and uh, more than likely, uh, will be joining uh, and, and possibly deploying to Afghanistan in, in January 2020. So uh, it's remarkable, you know, just to think about how long this conflict's been going on. Nonetheless, uh, the the organization I, I work for is Rush University Medical Center. And I don't know how many of you have heard of the Warrior Care Network, just by raise of hands. Yeah, so not very many. So the Warrior Care Network is a conglomerate of four academic medical centers. Uh, Rush University Medical Center, where I work, uh, Emory, down in Atlanta, uh, UCLA, Operation MEND, and then home base, um, uh, Mass General. Combined, uh, our mission is to provide, uh, at, at, at no cost, free mental health care to military veterans um, suffering with the invisible wounds of war, specifically the program that I work at is, is trauma-based. So we, uh, we bring in veterans from throughout the nation, and I would say even the world, because I've conducted intakes with uh, veterans still serving, you know, maybe in uh, Korea or whatnot. Uh, but anyhow, we, we, we bring the folks in for three weeks of intensive trauma treatment, and uh, we cover the entire cost. We cover, as soon as the, the veteran opens the door, um, we, 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 ha we have it all covered. That includes the um, flight, the housing, the food. Um, and what's interesting enough is that we are having some pretty s remarkable res results with this program. Uh, we have about a 92% success rate, completion rate, 97% satisfaction rate, and we are seeing significant reductions um, in, in the symptomology. And not only are we seeing this at our program, but we're also seeing it at the other uh, three academic medical centers. And I think that's really cool because what we're finding is that we can intensify these effective evidence-based treatments that may not be as understood or impactful uh, in an outpatient basis setting because of, of client dropout. Uh, so that's a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, right now, I, uh, two years ago, I had the opportunity to pitch a concept to uh, oversee and run my own satellite clinic 189 miles south of Chicago in a very rural setting. And that's really what I'll be speaking to today is that rural veteran uh, mental health care. So I'm Joy Onstead. I have a doctorate of pharmacy, a master's in business, and then I am licensed as a commercial underwriter in insurance. So I am a 2012 Tillman Scholar. And my background is very rural health care in America. I grew up with no health care, um, 60 miles from any health care. I don't have a birth certificate. We didn't go to the doctor. There's huge gaps in rural areas. So that's my passion to go out and work in rural areas. So I practiced after graduation in 2016. I went to Alaska, and, and now I'm back in Wyoming. 
I practice in several settings in Wyoming. Currently, I'm a clinical director at a hospital, and it's a nonprofit or a 99-bed hospital, but we're the only healthcare within 100 miles. So we have an oncology, dialysis, anything in that 100 miles comes directly to us. So I'm very involved in what we can do to reach out to patients because we're running into these deserts in healthcare in our communities where there's no one out there. And often when I'm out doing um, community outreach or working to take medications to a patient, I'm the first healthcare provider they're gonna have contact with. And a lot of the skills I picked up in military, I worked in life flight for five years for the Air Force Transcontinental, is those skills I learned there I'm using to triage and um, help patients who can't drive or don't have access to those providers. Now, Sanki Blake sort of talked about, you know, an aspect of, of, of rural Illinois, right? Joy describing some of the challenges, you know, or at least this, this, this context of this community um, where there are deserts, right? The, tell us a little bit about, about your experience in terms of just in terms of the scholar and then some of your recent experiences abroad. All right. Um, so my name is Sanki, and I'm a fourth year medical student, and just kind of touching on the imposter phenomenon talk we just had. I mean, sitting with the uh, panelists with uh, more established pedigrees and actually doing work, I kind of feel like an imposter here myself. Um, but I uh, feel that I was brought here to kind of give a more global health perspective uh, due to my interests. Um, I was a field med corpsman uh, with the Marines uh, with some deployments to Afghanistan, and it was there that I fell in love with medicine and kind of had this desire to serve, um, continue serving overseas in a medical capacity, which led me to med, med school and uh, my plans to go into trauma surgery uh, next year with the intention of going back to low resource communities overseas to provide services. And uh, so to better prepare myself for that, uh, last year I started a, uh, took a year off to do a master's in public health focusing on global health, which um, the culmination of that was six weeks I spent in Sierra Leone. And uh, while I was in Sierra Leone working on a public health project, I really got to you know, observe firsthand the healthcare system there and see a lot of the challenges and problems they have, as well as some of the solutions that they've in implemented there. Now, Sierra Leone has one of the worst healthcare systems in the world. Some of the metrics, uh, they're top 10 in terms of infant mortality, they're number one in terms of maternal mortality. It's very understandably slow. Uh, so they started out as a low resource country as it is, and then in the 90s, uh, they had an 11 year brutal civil war that destroyed the infrastructure, um, decimated their healthcare system, and after the war, they slowly started rebuilding um, their healthcare system. And then in 2014, the uh, Ebola epidemic at West Africa, and it kind of really highlighted the limitations of the healthcare system and sowed a lot of distrust by the population into the system. Uh, and so since you know that, the last several years, they've been slowly trying to, again, rebuild their healthcare system, and I got to really see that. Um, in global health, we uh, sometimes talk about a three-delay model. Um, and uh, it's usually applied to maternal mortality, but I think it applies to you know, health and global health in general. Uh, the first delay being the uh, delay in seeking medical care, either you know, in recognizing their problem or you know, deciding to go seek help. The second delay is getting to a healthcare facility, and third delay is being seen by someone once they uh, get to the facility, which is usually due to uh, not enough providers. In Sierra Leone, we see all three of these delays. Um, like I said, there's a distrust in the healthcare system, and with low access, you know, a lot of diseases aren't seen until too late. Um, for the second delay, uh, you know, they have a few well-paved roads, but in general, the roads are horrible. Most people don't own vehicles, um, few ambulances, a few public transportation, so getting to the hospital can be very, very difficult for a lot of people. For the third delay, there's just not enough healthcare providers. If we look at doctors, out of a um, population of 7.6 million people in the country, there are an estimate of less than 200 doctors in the entire country. Um, and put in different figures, that's one doctor for every 42,000 people in Sierra Leone. And uh, for perspective, in the US, it's one doctor per every uh, 390. Uh, and so, you know, the natural solution is to make more doctors, but in Sierra Leone, there's only one health, uh, one uh, medical school there. And last year, they were able to um, churn out 25 doctors, so it's gonna take a long time to actually build up their, uh, their physicians. And so to address this problem, Sierra Leone government and the Ministry of Health and Sanitation has kind of developed a tiered system um, uh, of healthcare. And it starts out at the lowest level at the community health workers. And these are 
people within the villages that are recruited and trained for two or three months to act as the first line agents in health. They can do some basic medical services, but the biggest role I think they play is kind of acting as a bridge between the villages and the higher healthcare systems kind of helping with that trust issue and also being able to identify those red flags of, hey, you need to go seek further care and make the 15, 20, minute, uh, 20 mile walk to the nearest hospital or, or, or whatnot. Um, at the next level, you have um, maternal and child health posts um, that are staffed by uh, the equivalent of uh, medical assistants, and then um, community health posts that are staffed by nurses and midwives, and then uh, community health centers staffed by the equivalent PAs, and then find the hospitals where all the doctors are. And so what you see is a tiered system of healthcare that starts at the lowest level in the village and then works your way up, um, which allows a kind of triage of healthcare and a better utilization of the people with the healthcare so that the you know, doctors and even the um, uh, physician's assistants aren't overwhelmed by just a large number of people that need help. You know, in, in terms of you know, global health that may be interesting, and you might wonder you know, how does this apply to US healthcare? And of course, there's a lot of difference between the healthcare in Sierra Leone and the US, but um, especially if you look at the social um, communities with a low socioeconomic status, uh, we see these same three delays. Especially with chronic disease, there's a delay in recognizing that there's a problem. Um, we see in the hospitals during rotations, a lot of people that the first time they've been to a doctor's uh, for years is they have full-blown liver cirrhosis and at that point there's nothing we can do for them or they have their first MI. And um, I just had a patient uh, a couple weeks ago that didn't like going to the doctor, he had an MI and he passed away last week. And by this point, it's much too late. Uh, you have populations that don't, also don't trust the healthcare systems for various historical reasons. In terms of delays, um, I know Joy, when we were talking, was talking about some of the distances that some people have to travel um, in, in certain rural areas to get to healthcare facilities. But in places even like Pittsburgh, if you live in the outskirts of the city, people will have to travel an hour and a half, two hours, transfer by three or four buses just to get to an appointment. And if you got a mother with four kids that are trying to do a newborn appointment, it can be very challenging. And you know, we see a lot of missed appointments because of that. And in terms of third delay, uh, while we have the better ratio of one doctor per 390 people, uh, this isn't equally distributed. And so certain places don't have the access to healthcare providers that we see. In terms of seeing the problems that we have in the United States, I think you know, we need to look you know, outside of the United States sometimes to find solutions in terms of community-based um, health initiatives um, like Sierra Leone. Um, I think a lot of the viewpoints for global health is that it's you know, the Western countries kind of giving the, the great uh, wisdom experiences of our country to these poor, um, less fortunate countries, but I don't quite see it that way because especially working with people in Sierra Leone, these are people that have learned to do as much as they can with what limit, limited resources they have. And as a country, I think we're realizing that in healthcare, we don't have unlimited resources and that we're gonna have to start triaging our healthcare systems as well. And so I think there's a lot we can learn from these, uh, these communities. And that's a fascinating sort of exposition that you just offered to this, uh, Sanki. And, and, and again, I think it's an interesting contrast. And, and Joy, I'm actually gonna pose a question to you because uh, when you think about Sierra Leone, right, the, the civil war there that is then immediately followed by an outbreak, it is like the definitive description of like cataclysm, right? Um, yet there are very different stimuli at work in the food deserts that, or excuse me, in the, the medical deserts that you were just describing. And I'm sort of curious, um, because of a potentially more gradual development of that same dilemma, those same sort of delays or similar delays, I would be interested just to hear your reaction of that from the context of the community in which, in which you serve. I think that, you know, we could use some of the things they're doing in Sierra Leone and bring it back to our rural areas. Um, it used to be that providers would graduate and kind of spread out across the United States, and now our healthcare system working in it um, for business reasons, for logistics reasons, a lot of time has become more centralized with um, access. So the, having those first line providers would be extremely helpful in a lot of the populations we have where access is becoming more and more limited as our healthcare system becomes more centralized. I think we have a lot of providers out there that are trying to reach our patients and a lot of communication is the key 
and we're looking for ways that we can use um, integral pieces that we've developed to reach out. So I think we can take ideas from around the world, and if we merge them together, we could not only support our healthcare system, but internationally develop those same type of models. That's interesting. And then, Blake, in terms of some of the challenges that you see, and again, so we've, we've gone from this sort of global perspective to then this sort of regional perspective, and then, then the context and community in which you practice, Blake, is sort of even smaller than that. Are there still parallels there? What, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing that's in a very specific veteran-based community yep. in, in a different state? Yep, so if we think of Illinois alone, uh, we would need to add over 200 mental health providers to fill the current um, shortage that we have. Currently, I'm the only psychologist um, uh, that is practicing um, in, in my clinic down, downstate. Of course, we have the, the C-Box um, that are available, but what we find is that oftentimes the hours of operation are not conducive with the veterans' work schedule, and we have a very low unemployment rate in, the, in our veteran community right now, so it suggests that a lot of veterans are, are working. Yet, the, you know, for Illinois, the median household income is about $56,000, and the low income rate is about Forty-eight thousand. So, what we're finding is that you know individuals are less willing to sacrifice work hours. Um, you know, and again, the thread of selfless service to to do some self-care. Um, so, we I almost have to take the triage approach as well. And that uh, when an individual comes in, because I have such limited time, if the case is of severe mental illness, I have to leverage. And, and again, we're we're not here to replace the VA. We're just here to be like more of a multi. Um, uh, combat multiplier and try to fill the gap. And so what we try to do is, is establish a very good working relationship with the VA, the, you know, the big dog on the block. And we've been fortunate enough that they've given us a, a VA liaison to help uh, coordinate care. But uh, certainly we, we are doing triage and, and trying to identify those individuals um, in a severity level that I can treat on an outpatient basis. If that's not the case, uh, my options are to refer up to um, Rush for intensive outpatient or I'm leveraging various resources within the, the Department of Veteran Affairs um, uh, to do residential or inpatient care. Now, in, in terms of, uh, we, we've talked a little bit of, about each of you in terms of this question of numbers and just scarcity of, of, of providers. And we've, you've, each of you have sort of described it in two different factors. So, Sonia, you pointed out an aspect of time in terms of the, the, the development of that. Is, when we think about the, these broad systems, um, where does your own perspectives of working your way through the educational system, right? You know, because just in terms of the pipeline from, you know, first year medical student to doctor or any of the, the, the doctorates that, that each of you have, it's not ex extremely rapid. I mean, how big of a problem is that aspect of time and sequencing um, that, that, that you've seen? Um, in terms of, I mean, the time, uh, especially for like um, physicians, it, it's, it's substantially large. I mean, coming graduate, being a college graduate, um, you have a minimum of <clears throat> at least seven years uh, before you're actually going to start practicing. Since I'm crazy enough to go into trauma surgery, that's actually 11 years um, since I started medical school. Um, and since I'm 44 now, that means I'll be 51. And so the, the, the aspect of how long it takes is very looming in my head. I, I've made some decisions to, to take that route because uh, of uh, some autonomy overseas when I practice. But, uh, but ca that can be a very in, um, big impediment or, you know, to, to adding providers to um, the system. And you know, you know, in my studies in public health, I, I think you know, there is a drive towards using um, other providers that, you know, such as PAs you know, with two years of schooling, no residency, um, or nurse practitioners, which is somewhat more cost effective and a shorter period to actually create more providers. Um, <clears throat> but um, I think there is some controversy, I think partially from doctors that are, wor are worried that that may take away something from their role. Um, Interesting, so doctors that already already exist. Yes. Then. Um, and in fact, Joy, we actually had another conversation in terms of doctors that currently exist now in your area that, that are there now, but will they be there in the future? And does that dynamic of, of in your community exacerbate this problem of the throughput from the educational perspective um, in terms of where, where you're providing a lot of care? So where I'm working on a lot of care, um, I have older doctors that have practiced and moved into communities and they're part of the communities. A lot of them have been there practicing 30, 35 years. And we're struggling to get new um, 
providers to come in as well as to fill those slots. Even as a pharmacist traveling to rural areas, a lot of times if you're the only pharmacist in that community, finding someone to come fill in if you want vacation is extremely hard because you have to have a wide variety of skills because you're there and there's no one to um, fall back on. So you, you'll get to see patients that you normally would see in a large center would get more siloed and sent into a specific specialty. You're gonna be that first line provider. I think looking at this is it's encouraging providers to reach out um, and try some rural areas, try these experiences. Um, I, I applied for residency when I graduated. I got Alaska. I was, I'm gonna be honest, I was like, oh, okay. You know, I went in Colorado, University of Colorado, and so I'm like, well, we'll just flow with it. And we went up there, and it was a great experience because working in a large hospital in Alaska, the largest in the area, I got to see everything in 3,000 miles. Normally, that would be sent to a specialty, and we got to experience some things I would never see and then come back and practice in a smaller hospital. I could say, oh, I've seen this. I can help. So I would look at ways to reach out and bring providers into these areas and look at how do we disseminate providers back into these areas and encourage them that um, it's not a dead-end opportunity. It's an opportunity that provides you with a great skill set and great experience. I love my patients. Um, I love that in a community I get to know them all, as well as the providers I work with that are older providers, um, we get to see them and interact with them very closely and it becomes a very team-like dynamic rather than someone I, I don't know and I'm just going to go see a doctor in a practice. So I would encourage providers to go there as well as look for solutions. We need solutions technology-wise, we need solutions law-wise, we need solutions uh, to bring it there that are um, mixing more than just medical care together, bringing the business aspect into it to help sustain these medical systems. Because if we lose hospitals in the area I'm at, um, one of them I work with regularly, if they lose that hospital, then the next care is 200 miles in any direction. So I think that if we bring in the providers, encourage people, you know, come experience this and help us out, that it'll grow. No, it's interesting. So each, each of you, all, and, and Blake, on, on you responded to this as well. So Sangha, you're talking about, you know, just I can only, it is hard to wrap my head around, you know, the, the delicate and intricate skills, you know, in terms of not only an assessment and then the teaching aspect and then the, the skills that your own hands have to be honed to do in terms of trauma surgery, right? Um, Joy, you were just talking about, you know, aspects of technology, of law, of innovation. Um, like you're, you're also talking about not only the complex system of the, the human mind and specific counseling on people that you're, that you're counseling and providing direct help to, but then there's also these systemic issues. Is there a huge difference in terms of what you're experiencing in practice versus what you were actually learning within your educational degree programs? And if you could sort of talk, it, it, does that a contrast? Is it as much as it seems or is it more? And how would you describe describe those things, Blake? If you could start, we'll yeah, uh, you know, I think uh, with our community uh, having awareness that something there's there's a problem, and, and your willingness to uh, to be vulnerable, as we we talked about earlier, to to reach out for care. Uh, the stigma is very strong. We we learn it very early in our, our careers, oftentimes starting in basic training, uh, that if I if I receive we or treatment, I you know um, I am weak. Uh, we see this e even more prevalent in a rural setting where maybe the um, the mental health clinic is on a, on a main highway and you know pulling your vehicle into that that clinic is going to put a red flag in people in your area uh, that you are in fact uh, receiving treatment uh, avoidance is another thing that we see uh, being a big factor that limits uh, ones that willing to to engage uh, in the therapeutic process um, and we talked earlier about geographical limitations suitability of uh, providers um, Outside the Department of Veteran Affairs, only about 13% of community mental health providers are culturally competent to provide adequate, adequate care to, to military veterans. And, and so that's a problem. And one of the strategies that we're hoping um, to challenge this is, is we are providing more additional evidence-based treatment to local community providers because, again, this problem cannot be solved by the Department of Veterans Affairs. It can't be solved by the, the Warrior Care Network, but we believe it has to be solved by the community. 
uh, to include uh, primary care providers to be start to identify individuals who maybe have depression or anxiety or other mental health uh, conditions and then start to funnel them to uh, clinical psychologists or other mental health providers to do a screening. Um, so that's one of the, the, the approaches that we, we are uh, trying to take to solve this problem and just dis disparity of care. And, and Joy, any thoughts mm -hmm. on yours? Again, the contrast between what you experienced in school, and I would even ex expand that to you, if, if, whether that be business school or, <laughs> or, or, or your doctorate in, in, in pharmaceutical studies, um, and practice. A contrast? Reactions to that? The contrast is huge. Um, so a doctorate of pharmacy is eight years of school, and then a lot of times if you do residency, it's one to three years residency after that. And we focus on medications, but oftentimes, and I just have a student this week who told me, he's been on rotation now with me for three weeks. He's like, I had no idea what you did as a clinical pharmacist or how much I needed to learn because we are, we've grown so much as a profession. We've changed from just filling prescriptions. Um, about 20 years ago, it wasn't professional for us to share our knowledge. We couldn't talk to a patient, we couldn't share with a provider what that information was, and now we're working very much side by side with the doctors. A lot of the doctors I work with, they'll, they'll make the diagnosis, and then they'll ask me, okay, so what can we treat them with, and can you select for that patient the most affordable treatment? So part of their diagnosis in treating the patient is then we need to find a medication that's appropriate for the treatment, but it's also affordable for those patients. So it's very different than what we learned in school. And schools are starting to adapt, but we, because it's a different language. When I went from the pharmacy school over to the business school, because I took them at the same time and I have a background in business, it's two separate languages, and we have to work to bring those languages together so that our patients can have affordable care, because we can prescribe them a new medication, say this is what you need to be treated with, but then if they get to the pharmacy and they can't afford it, then that treatment's ineffective because they won't be able to afford it and then they won't take it and then you'll end up with them down the road in the hospital in critical health care too far to be treated with basic meds. So I think it's working in tandem and really bringing the communication piece in there and sharing our knowledge between our professions. Uh, again, I think that's fascinating. And this notion of the time lag, of just the time it takes for institutional adaptation, from either a Pittsburgh perspective or a Sierra Leone perspective, that, that institutional adaptation, uh, what, what have you seen along those lines? Well, I think I'm kind of in uh, the sweet spot in seeing that transition. I mean, I'm near the end of my formal career, uh, or formal education, and, um, and starting to enter into the real world and seeing the things. And, it, the level of complexity is, um, is you know, sometimes a little overwhelming. I mean, in medical school, they start out with very simple um, patient presentations that come up with a very obvious diagnosis. And in reality, a lot of these patients have so many different comorbid conditions and different things that are going on without a you know, classic presentation that you have to really wrap your head around it. <clears throat> and the same thing on the public health side, where, you know, in my public health school, it was very basic level um, public health and then going to Sierra Leone and seeing the real implementation of public health, it factors in um, social, economic, cultural aspects that you know we barely touched on in school. And even adding on to that, as I wanna go into, as a doctor into you know, a long-term solutions plan in med medical school, um, they teach you to focus on basically one patient and, and mm. you know, solve the problems of that patient and onto the next patient and the other patient. And I think adding on the public health knowledge actually gave me a whole different perspective in terms of health. Um, one example I have is um, in the middle of my public health year uh, last year, I uh, went to, with Team Rubicon to the Commonwealth of Northern Marianas Islands to respond to the typhoon there. And I'd been with Team Rubicon before for a disaster a response in Nepal, and from there, I, when I was there I, uh, in Nepal, I saw it purely as a medical problem, you know, help people, help people, help people um, with medical conditions. But after having some exposure to public health, and when I arrived to uh, Tinian and Saipan, you know, the world opened to 
the public health aspect of it, not approaching it on a single patient, but seeing it as a population. What are the needs um, of the population looking at disease control, looking at more chronic um, conditions of going on with these people that are affected by this disaster and, and compounded by um, the limitations from, from there. And so, you know, kind of that merge of seeing what the real world out like and, and seeing the complexity of it has is, is been eye-opening. Uh, I, I think complexity is, as you said, is, is probably a, a, a woeful understatement that's there. But I do appreciate e each of our panelists in terms of describing in, in these different contexts um, some eye-opening uh, concerns along those lines. And I think to keep those contexts in mind, I'd really like to transition and, and open up uh, to, to, to the Slido tool uh, of questions of the audience. And what I really appreciate, again, it, it, it's not just not the medical folks in the audience. Again, it is aspects of, of innovation. It's aspects, again, of technology, law, policy. Um, so again, thank you for that, that, that introduction. And I think we, we transition in. So, so please, please, please type away. Hmm, okay, that's a great one. I'm actually gonna stand back and, and go. So I see our, our first question up there. Specialists are hard to attract rural areas. Um, the Veterans Affairs Scan Echo uses primary care doctors to provide specialty care. What are some of the advantages and challenges the, that, you, that you, see, you see with it? Anyone wanna take a first stab at that one? So one of the challenges I've seen, uh, at least with this, the VA that I usually work with uh, as, a, as a local CBOC, uh, is pain management and willingness for some of the, the primary care providers to, to, to offer a referral uh, for a veteran who's experiencing chronic pain and maybe they're using uh, opioids uh, to manage that pain long term. Uh, and, and so that's certainly something I think we need to do a better job of is attracting um, uh, pain management specialties within these rural communities so that we can decrease the opioid epidemic, which uh, is certainly prevalent in the lower part, at least of the state and uh, across the nation. Very, it's interesting as we see some of these more popular ones come up, uh, uh, Harold, Harold Pinson, I'm assuming is that it's, it's, I think, a fascinating question, right, from, from, from an MBA. Um, have any of you seen promising technology that addresses some of the gaps in care? If so, what? And if not, why do you think nothing's being developed? Joy, I think you mentioned technology first, so I'll point mm -hmm. to you, and okay. then after your answer, actually, Sangha, I want you to sort of react, again, from a global perspective where the context of technology can be very, very different. So please, Joy. So technology-wise, there's some really awesome technology out there for doing tele-appointments, doing tele-visits, bringing tele into the patient's home or into a rural town. Unfortunately, um, sometimes, and it depends state by state, as a hospital, we have to remain where we're at least breaking even so that we can continue to do business and support the communities. So we look at, is it sustainable? Can we sustain these teleservices? And part of that is right now, the laws haven't completely caught up with our teleservices. So we're not getting reimbursed for teleservices. So the patients need it. It would be a great solution to use our, our teleservices, but right now we're limited by reimbursement because the technology is there, but the laws or the regulations we're under haven't caught up with the technology. That's an interesting intersection, again, of technology, policy, and, and, and legal constraints. Tangi, your, your yeah. perspective? In terms of global health, um, I mean, I, I used to be a computer engineer uh, and electrical engineer, so uh, looking at the problem of global health, I, I kind of salivated certain technological advances. I mean, you know, um, when I went to Nepal, someone uh, was talking about 3D printing in low resource communities, and, and I went and bought a 3D printer, and I'm wanting to explore using that. Um, and whenever I hear about new talk technology, having point of care, low cost uh, technology, I, I'm, you know, my ears perk up and, and want to look at that. Um, but as uh, Joy pointed out, I mean, there is an issue of sustainability. Um, sometimes we do kind of get really excited about the technology and want to find a purely technological solution to that, um, which one, I mean, basically it, it may not be sustainable. I mean, especially a lot of these low resource countries, you know, here a $5 test would be great, but a $5 test over there is, is you know, days wage or more um, for, for some of these people. And, and so it, it is not necessarily a cheap solution. And so we have to find that kind of sweet spot between, okay, how can we utilize new technology that works with the people and, and the more um, person aspect of, of medicine uh, in terms of global health? You know, that's an interesting piece, and I can only 
think back to some of Lashana's comments as well previously, you know, and this ability to listen, right? And that being sort of a compliment. Um, and again, I think that that also is a key, a key tie-in. Um, and, and again, it's also tied to my grandmother's advice. She always told me that you know I've, you have two ears, one mouth, employing them in the same in the same ratio. Uh, but uh, I think that's a fascinating, a fascinating piece. Yeah, of I, I mean, I think in terms of public health and global health, um, I mean, it was part, more so in the past. But and we're getting a little better. But the idea was okay. You know, we have this great idea to go uh, implement in this country, and so we're going to go there and, and do this, and it's going to be great. And, these people haven't even gone to the country and, and haven't asked the people, what do you actually really need? What, what do you want? What are your problems? Uh, and then trying to find a solution, working with them to actually do something that's useful to the community, then what's well, actually kind of cool. Right, and you can't see the question, but there's a question about sustainability that's on there as well, which I think goes, goes probably part and parcel in that that's you know, probably gonna be very, very specific to, uh, to, to that country. Like I'm sort of curious in terms of uh, in your practice, what, what do you see in terms of the sustainability challenges um, with just the population that's there mm -hmm. um, and those those needs? Sure, we are philanthropically funded. So uh, last 2018, we received a, about a $40 million grant to run our program. Uh, kind of speaking to technology, we do use technology very heavily in our practice. And I think one of the reasons why we're uh, able to do that is because we, we can provide the service and not have to charge. So we don't have to worry about the billing aspect of the telehealth at this point. Uh, we use telehealth to conduct our uh, intensive outpatient intakes through telephone or video. And again, we can do that with individuals. Um, anyone who has access to broadband or a telephone, we can do that. In my own practice, about 30, 40% is telehealth. So I am at this time providing trauma treatment to appropriate veterans who meet various safety um, uh, kind of guidelines, but we are providing uh, trauma treatment in their house so they don't actually have to come to our clinic and we're trying to break down uh, some of those barrier, barriers that way uh, through that component. Another exciting piece of uh, legislation that's coming out is called the SIPACT and essentially what that's going to do, it's nine states I think at this point in time who are going to allow clinical psychologists to practice across state lines without having to be licensed in that state through telehealth and that's pretty exciting. Uh, Illinois will be joining that pact in, in 2020. Um, so I think we'll be able to leverage that and some of the stuff that we're all already doing. But in regards to sustainability, you know, our current grant is five years. You know, what, what does that look like uh, after the five-year time frame? And we really think it's going to have to be a mix of uh, donations, federal government, and, and some type of billing aspect uh, where we're not necessarily charging the veteran but billing for the service through insurance. Now that that emphasis on tele uh, of, of telehealth there did that come to as, as a surprise to you and and, and it, I think you touched upon it as well, Joy. If, if was that a surprise to you, Blake? The the, the new law. How much like that percentage of the time that you spend on the, the telehealth aspect? It, of it's interesting because I typically when I see a, a significant barrier, for example, I have some veterans who are traveling two hours to see me. Uh, it's an hour long session. That's a five hour commitment out of their day. And oftentimes, you know, I'll say, hey, we have this telehealth. If, if you're interested, we could try it out. And they're like, no, no, I'm good. And about four or five weeks later, you know, after driving five hours to their appointments, they're like, hey, tell me about that telehealth thing again. And, and that's kind of how it's slowly been growing in my clinic. Uh, and, and, you know, the research is pretty clear that it's just as effective as face-to-face -face interactions um, or therapy. But still, philanthropy is then a critical component that enables that opportunity. Yes, it's the only way that currently we would be able to offer that because we can do a 500 no charge where we are not charging for that, mm. for that appointment. Otherwise, it would be very challenging, as you're indicating earlier, to, to absorb that cost depending on uh, what your organization looked like and how it was requiring and needing those funds through those services. Mm. Enjoy, could philanthropy be a potential solution to the challenges, particularly some of the legal and the policy challenges mm -hmm. that you were describing in, out it, in the West? It could be. Um, mm -hmm. It's state by state, but yeah, it's one of those things we look for and we look for grants, but then if we start those programs, then how do we sustain them? Mm -hmm. we, we do use telehealth in the current hospital I'm in for certain um, critical ER visits that we're shipping patients, that's available for us. And we have that set up, but outside clinics is where we're hoping to go. Hmm. Interesting. Now I'm going to actually move our way up in terms of increasing the number of uh, the popularity of questions, because the last one could be very, very interesting, I think. Um, but one of the great questions out there 
uh, from, from Tommy. I think Tommy Meyerson, he's asking for a specific one policy change um, from each of you um, that will, you would most like to see to address the challenges that you described. And I, think that's a, I think that's a great question as an election cycle that probably never ends is, is, is gearing up to a higher gear when we talk about policy, not politics, but policy. And Sangi, if we, if we could start with you, one policy, public policy change you would most like to see as it could potentially affect Sierra Leone. Uh, in terms of Sierra Leone, a policy. And maybe even whose policy, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Honestly, I mean, in terms of the complexity of the problem with Sierra Leone, um, it's a very difficult question to ask. I was trying to think of something more US-based. That's fine, too. Because um, I haven't even... Because uh, that's not necessarily that. simple nor easy, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, in the US, um, I mean, uh, Joy was talking in terms of... Um, I forget what the question was, in terms of attracting specialization um, to... Uh, uh, especially for providers, and um, I mean, there there are programs in order to attract people to, um, you know, go to rural areas, provide them scholarships. Um, but with the large number of people wanting to go to med school, um, in the few number of seats, I mean, I think there could be some potential in um, tying some seats to med school with service to um, rural areas um, in uh, in places like Africa, Kenya, and these countries, like for surgery. Uh, uh, residencies, it's tied to you need to work in rural communities for four or five years um, in order to have this education. And I think um, that may attract people a little bit more um, favorably to work in these rural communities by you know, the competitiveness of try even getting to med school mm -hmm. to these seats. Mm -hmm. Joy, your thoughts? One, one public policy change that, that would be a benefit to the community that you serve? Mm -hmm. Overall, as pharmacists, we've had a lot of changes, and we're already in most communities. Usually, your pharmacy is available, and we've, we have the education. The one policy change we're looking at nationwide that would be helpful is if we could get provider status to do those first-line triage items for patients. One of the big ones I see that I'd, we're working on as an industry is Narcan availability to patients and just being able to nationwide be able to prescribe that and get it out to patients, I think would make a huge difference. Blake, policy um, change? Yeah, I think I, think I talked about a little bit earlier, uh, stigma, and, and I think if we can start to address stigma earlier on in one's military career, maybe uh, they'll be more open to, ex to examining mental health treatment um, prior to it becoming an issue. So maybe some policies related to um, mandating some type of mental uh, health awareness, more, you know, again, trying to disrupt the, the stigma that happens in basic training. Uh, you know, if that gets too watered down, then the second one would be uh, during the time of discharge, if someone's being medically discharged for a mental health reason, uh, to ensure that that person um, has a pretty significant reduction of symptoms before we, we discharge them. And right now, you know, the Army has about a 180-day window from the time the MedCon process that they want an individual to be discharged. And I'm not so sure that's enough time to appropriately treat an individual for some of these conditions, especially given the length and intensity of, of the conflicts they may have been exposed to. Um, so, I think those are all, all each insightful. Now this next question is about national current political rhetoric. Um, and I'll, what barriers are present coming from the current administration's rhetoric? in terms of educating, in terms of educating Americans about health issues. The specific question is in terms of underdeveloped nations, um, and then potentially that could be interconnected with, with these different communities that, that are talking about. And again, so that's a, that's a very high order question, right? Rhetoric is, is rhetoric. Have you seen any potential challenges to that, particularly in terms of the educating factor of what doctors do, right? Latin root of doctor is it's, it's to teach. Um, and I think that, that, that's actually sort of the approach on that aspect of, as, as you've seen in interactions, have you seen an effect that relates back to some just heightened rhetoric that exists in our political climate? Well, I, I think, you know, in terms of, of the current administration, I think there is this 
kind of, not isolationist, but kind of, a, of drawing in a little bit. And I, I think it also, it ties back to what I was saying, where there is a viewpoint where we're just giving to other countries and not necessarily getting back, but I think it needs to be a realization that there are things that we can get back by these partnerships and that we mm -hmm. are just one large global community rather than, you know, the United States versus everyone else um, that, that do affect, um, you know, this ecosystem of the world. Mm -hmm. And so we need to focus on it. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm seeing most is that um, just we need to increase communication versus put things towards silos. That we have a lot of um, emphasis on filling out the regulatory paperwork when we need to be focused on how do we help people. Mm -hmm. Blake? Yeah, uh, could you maybe re-summarize that a bit? I could re-summarize that you. again. Yeah, Sorry. It's, 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 it's a bit of a summary. So what, what barriers does this administration's rhetoric present in educating Americans about the health issues? Okay. Um, I don't know. Next. I think I'm going <laughs> to skip that one. Yeah. I'm not going to go there. And if, and if you've seen that. <laughs> I'm magnanimous. I'll let that one pass, okay. right? Okay. We Thank can you. let that one pass. We can let that one pass. Um, this is an interesting one. Joy, we'll start with you. A little bit of a, an MBA perspective on it as, as well. It's asking just perspective on our current medical insurance models, right? Um, should we opt for a Medicare for all model or a private marketplace insurance? Um, and again, are there different nuances in the community that you serve that, that, that potentially could be a surprise to someone that, that doesn't have that intimate knowledge with, with those areas? I think looking at insurance-wise, um, we do need a solution. I'm not sure that any specific solution, whether um, we do insurance for all or we keep it all privatized, is a good option. It needs to be blended. It needs to have options, and um, we all need to come to the table and talk about it. I think right now, and I have a background in insurances, um, we're, we're not talking about it, and we're going different directions when we need to blend the systems. Our health system is based around how insurance was built, so if we switch it quickly, we would completely um, hold the health system or jeopardize our health system. So it needs to be a blending and a mix and looking at how do we best do this so that everyone has access. Most of my day as a pharmacist is making sure that I can get an affordable med to a patient and reaching out and looking at different ways we can do that. Um, there's lots of legal requirements behind it and the amount of paperwork it can take sometimes to get access for a patient even if they have insurance or don't have insurance can take days and it's one of those processes if we sat down and removed some of the regulations and I think you got all players to the table we'd have a better solution than we have now they're all they all have their good points and they all have their bad points so we need a blending mm -hmm. okay, any thoughts or? yeah um, in terms of you know the focus on healthcare insurance as a solution problem, I, you know, personally, I feel that kind of um, is a stopgap bandage, you know, area versus the larger problem of rising healthcare costs. I mean, it's the mentality that we are an unlimited system and, you know, by focusing on insurance, it kind of hides that because if we pay our insurance, then everything else kind of gets covered and we don't have to worry about it. But there are issues where we have to make kind of the hard decisions and analysis of, you know, so like end of life care, we may spend hundreds of thousand dollars on extending a person's life by a month or two, which on some level, especially on the doctor perspective and, and the individual's perspective, it may be important. But if we looked at the, you know, financial impact of that, that hundred thousand or more um, dollars could be used to improve the lives of a hundred people or thousand people by 10 years. Um, by doing more lower cost preventive type measures and focusing more and more on on these lower cost issues and I think like you know to do the global perspective when you don't have that that uh, kind of safety net of insurance you know the 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 cost issue becomes more apparent but I mean, by focusing on the insurance part we kind of you know gloss over it hmm. all interesting Blake any any thoughts on yeah so again we're very fortunate that we don't have to so if, we, if the if the individual has insurance we will charge it we will just always pick up the copay that's how our program works we're very fortunate however if we want to advocate for 
uh, a client to go out and, and say go to a Spain or a pain specialty, you know, we, we need to help them to navigate the Veteran Choice um, Act, which can be somewhat complicated. But I, I see this being a, a bigger issue in state-funded insurance versus private insurance when we're seeking outside um, assistance for substance use disorder. And state-funded, you know, the individual's ready to go, they're ready to get treatment, pause, there's a wait list for state-funded. But if you have private funding, you know, you can get right in. This is a big problem, I, you know, that I see in our state uh, in, in regards to providing adequate substance abuse treatment in a very timely manner while the individual is motivated and willing to go and get treatment. And Blake, someone just asked you an extra sort of related follow-up question, and to a certain degree, if you think broadly about it, a VA benefit payment, right, mm -hmm. for a disability payment is sort of a, a form of, of insurance of sorts. It's a, it's a compensation or at least a transaction there. Do you see in your patients in that community sometimes a reluctance to attempt to resolve an issue because it's a there's a disincentive sure. on, on the monetary side of that. If you could, if you could so, sort of speak to that. So I worked in the VA for three years before Rush, and I did see the, there t appeared to be at times a correlation with reduction in symptoms. You know, we'd hit a plateau. Uh, and it, it did, it, you know, at times we'd have a conversation, um, and it did seem to be connected to their dis disability claim, right? If I, my symptoms go too low, then I'm gonna lose my check. At Rush, it's up to them if they wanna share their, their records with the VA. And so we do f tend to find that um, we have some pretty good results and, and we're able to have a conversation more around the compensation and how it won't be impacted if they're getting better. And we just leave it up, the choice up to them, again, if they want to release that uh, documentation, those records to the VA. Um, but I think that's the big different, differentiating factor is it does appear people are willing to be more vulnerable and open knowing that what they put in their notes is not going to uh, impact mm. their, their VA compensation. No, I, I think that, that that's a very important mm. distinction and thing to understand. So we got about a minute and a half left. Um, yesterday when, when John Krakow and Marie were talking to the, the, the 2019 scholars, one of the things that John mentioned about his understanding of PATH that he developed um, in, in, in writing this book, Where Men Win Glory, was PATH's like this undying optimism. Given the fact that we spent a good portion of an hour talking about some eye-opening challenges, what makes you optimistic about your experiences in each of the communities in which you served and practiced? That's a great question. Um, that was one of the things in Sierra Leone that kind of really blew me away um, was, was the people there. I mean, it was inspirational. I mean, these are Sierra Leoneans that really want to make change in their community. And you know, the whole model of the Westerners coming there and fixing everything is is BS. Um, what you need is the locals to develop their own community. And, and to see that passion and that dedication by these people um, just makes me want to do what I can to help. I mean, I'm just like technical assistance to them. I'm not the one that's going to solve the problem, but maybe I can provide a little bit of help um, to my neighbor in this world to, to help guide them along what they need to do. Joy, what makes you optimistic? I think it's the patients I work with and the communities I work with, because they're willing to change. They're asking, they're, what can we do? What solutions can we do? You know, can we get together and raise money? You know, our community needs this. So they're involved in their community, their hospital, their community pharmacy. They want to bring those things in, and they're positive, and they're trying to reach forward. And I think as long as we have that, it's always going to get better. As hmm. long as we're going forward and trying. Hmm. Thank you. And Blake? Yeah, I, I think we, we get into the profession of providing care to, uh, to help others. And so, you know, my clients, uh, the people I work with are front and foremost. However, the staff that I work with as well, we have a large team, about 70 individuals, 40% are veterans. Uh, we have a Gold Star mom. Our chaplain is a, a former Green Beret. Um, I don't know if I, 40, I think I said 40% of the staff are, are veterans, and it, it's just remarkable to see um, the innovation that when you put a group of, of veterans together and say, hey, we want to solve this problem, uh, how are we going to do it? And to actually see it ec being executed uh, is, is just remarkable, and that, that's really what's driving me to be, stay optimistic, that I think we can get a hold of this and, uh, and, and really do a lot of good. Yeah. Well, we are out of time, but thank you for a period of time that 
went by extremely quickly for me. Um, and thank you for drawing connections, I think enlightening um, quite a few folks in terms of the challenges that are there, but also for the impact and the work that each of you all are doing in those, in those communities. I think it's important, um, and I hope that these conversations uh, continue. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll start to populate these questions into Tillman Connect uh, again. And if, if it's of interest, if it is of concern, uh, please, for everyone, uh, continue to participate in it. But let's have a warm round of applause for these great scholars. Thank you.